Hello, everyone. We're just going to take a couple more minutes while more people are hopping on. Hello, everyone. We'll just take one more minute while more people are hopping on. Thank you. Welcome to the Native American Agriculture Fund's 2024 Request for Applications webinar. So how to ask questions. We ask that you submit all of your questions via the question and answer box or through the chat feature below. We will do our best to answer all the questions in the time allotted, but we will have additional resources provided after this webinar uh, in the form of a recording and to answer any of your follow-up questions. Uh, we also ask that if you have any questions after this webinar, to send them to grants at Native American Agriculture Fund dot org. Up next, I will go ahead and hand it to our Director of Communications and Policy, Whitney Sani. Okay, thank you for joining us for our 2024 Requests for Applications webinar. Um, so I want to provide a little bit more information and background knowledge about the Native American Agriculture Fund. So NAF is a private drawdown trust fund, and we are here today to talk about our grant making process. Our mission at NAF is to support Native American farmers and ranchers for the advancement of agriculture through business assistance, agricultural education, technical support, and advocacy services. We are focused on healthy lands, healthy people, and healthy economies, ultimately investing in work that finds solutions to challenges that Native American farmers and ranchers face, to increase access to capital for Native American producers. So now some more historic background about how NAF came to be. We're derived from a class action litigation at Keeps Eagle v. Vilsack, where claims were settled based on Native American farmers and ranchers and their lack of access to credit and credit servicing. Uh, Keeps Eagle was similar to other class actions at the time, and that was with Black farmers, Hispanic farmers, and female farmers. Um, Keeps Eagle was based on Native American farmers and ranchers that attempted to get loans from the U.S. Department of Agriculture or may have experienced poor loan servicing and violations under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, dating all the way back to the early 1980s. So for decades, many of the class representatives and their counsel uh, worked tirelessly on this, and they ultimately were able to get the department to settle $680 million in damages. Uh, that claims process resulted uh, and approved claims for more than 3,600 Native farmers and ranchers. Uh, beyond these settlement agreements, there were other things that the USDA promised to do as a result of the class action, and that included debt relief up to $80 million. For some producers, that debt forgiveness was one of the most important pieces because they, they wanted their land free and clear of debt. So as a part of the settlement agreement, a Cypre fund was created to go towards eliminating or reducing the original harms of the claimants. After a significant period of uh, negotiation, uh, but prior to NAF's creation, there was another process that occurred, and that was called the fast track. The fast track process occurred when $38 million was distributed immediately to entities that were serving and supporting Native American farmers and ranchers. Many of those fast track grantees have uh, continued the work in the space of native agriculture and have now become grantees of NAF. Uh, in 2018, the court directed that the remaining funds be distributed to the newly created Native American Agriculture Fund. So that's what we're doing here today in our grant making process. NAF was established with $266 million 
and NAF's work is governed by a trust agreement to distribute its funds over a period of 20 years. So NAF will provide eligible grants to um, eligible entities. And on the next slide, we'll go into a little bit more of our mission areas. So our mission is to provide business assistance, agricultural education, technical support, and advocacy services to Native American farmers and ranchers to support and promote their continued engagement in agriculture. And the next slide we'll see um, that our eligible entities include 501c3 organizations, educational organizations, CDFIs or community development financial institutions, and their tribal governments. Here you can see a map where our grantees are. And from 2019 to 2023, NAF has funded $67 million in grants to tribes, nonprofits, educational institutions, and those CDFIs I mentioned, which are our eligible entities. Some of the states that we have funded the most projects in include South Dakota, New Mexico, and Montana. But compared to the map below it, you can see where uh, Native producers are relative to where we have funded grants in the past. Um, and the map on the bottom, you can see that the states with the most native producers include Arizona, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. Uh, these numbers actually come from the 2017 Census of Agriculture. Uh, there have been new data sets released through the USDA National Agricultural, uh, Natural Agric National Agriculture Statistics Service um, and their 2022 census of agriculture data. Uh, through that data, we have seen that the number of producers have actually decreased from 2017 to 2022. However, we have seen uh, that a lot of other areas have increased for native producers and native ag agricultural production, including economic impact. So in 2017, we had about $3.5 billion in annual production value for agriculture, but that nearly doubled to more than $6 billion annually. Uh, so we'll see uh, a lot of those numbers specific to reservations that will be released in August. But if you're using some of the census of agriculture data, we encourage you to, to utilize that as a resource. We do understand that it has its limitations and fully capturing the, the, the full picture of agriculture in Indian country, but it is a useful tool for you um, and also uh, encouraging producers in your areas to participate in the census because those data sets are used to um, provide information for different decisions such as um, budget appropriations or different allocations of funding from different uh, organizations when it comes to funding agriculture. So next I'm going to turn it over to our director of program, Chanel Ford. Thank you, Whitney, for that wonderful overview, and thank you, Gabby. Welcome all to our 2024 RFA discussion. I'm going to go over um, eligible entities and some of our application process for this year. You will know if you have been a, pr a prior grantee or if you've filled out an application with us before. Some things have changed, um, but some have remained the same. So. Eligible entities, we have 501c3 organizations, educational organizations, community development financial institutions, and tribes in their instrumentalities. So as Whitney shared, um, we really are focusing on reducing the harms that our um, claimants faced um, when going through the Keep Siegel v. Vilsack um, litigation. And so our focus, we, we want the focus to, of these projects to be on geared towards agriculture. Um, and we'll, I'll share a little bit more about some of the prior projects um, we have funded in the past to give you a better bird's eye view um, if you're applying through your specific entity um what we what we look to fund all right so important notice i i just shared with you all a few things have changed this year within our 2024 rfa um so to ensure accountability and timely reporting existing grantees who are not in compliance such as those behind on quarterly annual and final reporting and updating updates relating to past grant awards and projects will be ineligible to apply for 2024 funding this is new for 2024, um, and we are working diligently 
to make sure that all of our prior grantees are in good standing, they are in compliance, and they are caught up on all um, outstanding reports if they have any outstanding reports. So please feel free to reach out if you are a current grantee and this will if this will impact you, please feel free to reach out to your point of contact. Um, each entity has their own point of contact. Graham Gator leads the CDFI and the 501c3 inbox. Cindy Farley and myself, Chanel Ford, we lead the tribes inbox, and Dr. Joe Graham and Riley Dizitel lead the EduOrg inbox. So please feel free to reach out to your POCs, send a direct message to that inbox, and request assistance if it is needed. <clears throat> Also noting, this is important for fiscal sponsors. So we encourage startup um, nonprofit organizations that have applied for your 501c3 status from the IRS, but not yet received a favorable determination to apply through a fiscal sponsor who can also provide the important tech support for proposed project activities. If fiscal sponsors are used, the fiscal sponsor must be an eligible 501c3 organization and should follow the guidance in our fiscal sponsor information. So um, the awesome um, note I want to point out here is when you go through our application process, we have documents listed um, that are very specific if you are to be utilizing a fiscal sponsor. So please refer back to that. Um, we also have information on our website. Um, we have, there are some questions we've answered in the past uh, regarding this in our FAQ page, um, but we are also happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, send all questions forward to the grants at Native American Agriculture Fund.org, and we will get those um, answered for you. So, just a note the relationship between grantees and the fiscal sponsor is not managed by NAF. And you are the, and it's the sole responsibility of the grantee. So if you so choose to um, apply for the funding through a fiscal sponsor, know that we will not be able to step in if there are any communication issues, if there are any funneling issues. Um, that is to be discussed um, and taken care of between you and the fiscal sponsor. All right, so we're going to go through a few um, of these bullets here, addressing access to capital, allowable use of funds, cost sharing or matching funds, collaborators, cooperators leveraging, limitation on indirect costs, eligibility of previous grantees, an allowable use of funds, and then initial review on eligibility. So access to capital, as Whitney shared to start, um, this was at the core of the Keep Siegel case. This is something that we look at when we are reviewing incoming applications, incoming projects and programming. We want to know how you will be planning to increase access to capital. Um, and a conversation on access to capital is available on our website if you would like a little bit of more information. Um, on how to um, really uh, show the impact in your grant application. Applications that don't address access to capital will not be funded in 2024, and I will go over um, our, our scaling on our applications and what our guidelines are for um, grading each application. All right, so this is for the 501c3 organization. If you plan to apply for our NAF funding 2024 and you have a targeted project, the available pool is $1 million. The minimum that we ask you to um, put into your project or programming is $100,000 with the maximum amount being $200,000. And we're really focusing here on business assistance, ag education, tech support, and or advocacy services. So when you go through the application, it will ask you how you are applying for the funding. Are you a 501c3? Are you an eduorg? Are you a CFI? Are you a tribal instrumentality? Each one of whichever entity you select to apply for, for our funding for, um, will direct you specifically 
through, we'll direct you through um, the application and have questions that apply to you. Some questions might apply to other entities that will not apply um, to you. If you're applying through a 501c3, your application may look different than a tribe. It may look different than a CDFI. So I do want to note here, each year we have special focus, special emphasis categories. This year, 501c3s, tribes, edu orgs are able to apply for the climate and regenerative agricultural practices special emphasis category. So if you choose to apply for our general funding, but you also have a unique project that differs that matches up with the climate and regenerative agricultural practices, you can then in turn apply for both. Um, so long as the applications do not mirror each other, they are not identical, um, you can uh, leverage your funding and, and potentially um, be awarded in both of these areas. So the available pool for the special focus category is $1 million. The minimum amount is 100,000. The maximum amount you can request is 200,000. So just to share a little bit about a prior um, 501c3 that is a, 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 they still are a current grantee of ours. Um, they chose to build a climate data portal on an online native land information system to house data critical to building resilience to climate change. So very unique project that is impacting pretty much all producers and, and any um, entity that is looking for information regarding climate um, throughout Indian country. So um, that is Village Earth and they're based out of Colorado. So as I'll, I'll share in the other, when we go forth through the other um, entities, no application we've seen has typically been the same. Um, so agriculture might look different in your community and your project might look different in your region. So this project obviously is impacting widespread um, throughout the country, impacting agriculture um, in, in different facets. Um, but yours might be very specific just to your region and just to your area. And we encourage that as well. All right, another targeted project, we have educational organizations. The educational organization available pool is 500,000. The minimum amount we ask that you put into your programming project is 75,000. The maximum amount you can ask for, you can request is 150,000. Again, we are asking that you focus projects on business assistance, ag education, technical support, and or advocacy services. As I shared previously, this entity also is available to apply for climate and regenerative agriculture practices. This is a special emphasis category. The available pool is $1 million. The minimum amount is $100,000. The maximum amount you can request is $200,000. Sharing a little bit about um, two previous grantees, um, or two current grantees, but had applied in previous years of funding. We have United Tribes Technical College out of North Dakota. Um, they design, they are utilizing funds to design and build a greenhouse um, for their sustainable ag and food systems program. And then we have Star School that is located in Arizona. They are choosing to utilize the funding to implement a livestock club to teach their students to how to raise sheep and cattle, um, how to care for them, how the butchering process works. And they're also integrating agriculture and education into their um, classroom. So as I said earlier, your projects can look different. They can be different. It can be nationwide impact. It can be your regional impact. Um, as long as it's tying back to agriculture um, and uh, production, then we are really excited to, to read through the applications and, and hopefully um, get you all some funding. So educational organization reminders, if you are applying for our funding as an educational institution, this covers all those under sections 170 of the IRS code, including K through 12 and post-secondary institutions. 
such, such as TCUs, tribal colleges and universities, Native Americans serving non-tribal institutions and other institutions must have history and experience in serving Native farmers and ranchers and Bureau of, of Indian Education, BIE schools. Um, further recommendations for TEP involvement requiring, required at universities with agents. I'll go into a little bit more about, I believe, our connection with BIE schools here on the next slide. So we are interested in investing in programs that provide information and guidance to Native youth that are interested in choosing food and ag as their future career choice, as well as specifically reaching out to Native students who attend these specific schools. For the first time, we are really excited to announce that Bureau of Indian Education, BIE schools, will be allowed to apply for funding. So um, I shared at the start, there might be some changes, new additions um, to this year's round of funding, and this is one of them. So if you have questions about this, please feel free to reach out at our, to our grants at uh, email, and uh, we'll provide um, feedback and comments to you. All right, getting back into our targeted project. So if you are going to be applying for funding as a CDFI, the available pool is 4.5 million this year. There's no minimum, but you cannot request the full available pool. So you will not be able to submit a budget that is $4.5 million in, request, in requested amount of funding. Um, the special focus area for our CDFIs is the climate and regenerative agriculture practices that I mentioned that goes along with the 501c3s, tribes, and educational institutions. The available pool is $1 million. The minimum amount we ask that you put into your um, request is $100,000. The maximum amount you can request here is $200,000. Well, CDFIs also have another special emphasis category that they can apply for, that, and this does not um, apply to educational institutions, our tribes, or 501c3s. So you do have the option as a CDFI to also apply for additional CDFI and native CDFI support. The available pool here is $1 million. The minimum amount we request that you ask in your budget is $100,000. The maximum amount here is $400,000. So with our CDFI projects, we want them to focus on loan capital, re-granting capital, and technical assistance and business assistance. To give you some insight on um, current grantees that we fund that are CDFIs, we have Occupton, which is out of South Dakota, and they serve tribal borrowers to meet the agriculture needs of producers. Um, upon loan approval, if they do receive a loan through Occupton, these individuals receive technical assistance, business planning, and risk management tools. We also have a Northwest Native Development Fund out of Washington State. They provide financing to Native producers. Um, they focus on um, really financing more Native-owned uh, cattle operations um, and enhancing um, uh, finance opportunities to uh, producers within their region and the area. All right, we have targeted projects and we're moving into our tribes and instrumentalities. The available pool we have here is $1 million. The minimum amount we ask that you put into your program is 100,000. The maximum you can request in your application is $200,000. The special, um, the special emphasis category that you are able to apply for if you're applying via a tribe is the climate and regenerative agriculture practices. The available pool here is $1 million. The minimum amount you can put into your application is $100,000. The maximum amount you can request is $200,000. And again, we hope to see projects come in that focus on business assistance, ag education, tech support, um, and or advocacy services. So um, a tribe that we have, uh, speak, uh, going back to, to region and what might be applicable to your region or your area, or is it servicing the entire um, country and that will be impacted by agriculture and your project? Um, we have a, a tribal grantee um, at 
coming uh, from Maine, uh, Passamaquoddy tribe. They had an eel project to support their native harvesters by stabilizing the market and increased ag-based employment. Um, we also have a Washington State grantee, uh, Sequamish Seafoods, who focused on harvesting um, gooey duck and clam, and then in turn um, packaging and um, distributing that to their uh, local businesses and their local casinos. So agriculture, as we know, as most of you know, look, can look very different um, in areas, um, and we encourage you to really focus on the impact that you're going to be having in your region, in your area. We also have Kalispell Tribe out of Washington State. who They are, um, they have a bison um, operation and they're really working to expand training opportunities for their community in food processing and agricultural production. Okay, instrumentality. So you've heard us mention tribes and instrumentality. So instrumentalities of a of tribes, state or federally recognized, can mean any number of things. So tribal governments have the latitude to determine which entities are instrumentalities of their governments. We only need proper documentation of that status. So if an organization wishes to be considered an instrumentality of a tribal government, the organization must secure and submit an authorizing document from that tribal government to that specific effect. A statement from an organization other than a tribal government will not suffice for this purpose. So we stress that um, you provide the needed documentation from that tribal government um, that you that you are connected to. So just an important reminder, if you are a new applicant, we do require a limited waiver of sovereign immunity. If you are applying for our funding um, as a tribal entity, there's no exceptions to this. Um, it's, it is needed. The, in the application process, there will be a note. If you click to apply as a tribe or instrumentality, there will be um, a note there about the limited waiver of sovereign immunity. You must click this in order to move forward in the application process. We do not need the limited waiver of sovereign immunity um, during the application process. It's just an understanding on your end that we will need a limited waiver of sovereign immunity if your um, project is funded. So enable for, for us to be able to distribute the funding out to you for you to get your first installment, we would need the sovereign, um, the limited waiver of sovereign immunity um, signed and, and submitted to our um, back end support team. So that's just a note. I know that there might be um, questions on whether or not you have to have this prior to applying. You do not. Um, you just need to be aware that it is needed if you are to be funded. And then also a note here on industrial hemp. We only fund feasibility or market studies. Um, so if your project is focusing on anything other than feasibility or market studies, it will not be funded. So just going in a little bit more detail of our sovereign immunity waiver. So Native American Agriculture Fund, we're a charitable trust um, created by the 2010 settlement of the Keep Siegel versus Vilsack class action lawsuit. The settlement agreement provided for the distribution of grants to federal and state recognized tribal governments and their instrumentalities. So NAF recognizes that tribes are immune from suit or action as a sovereign government and that sovereign immunity is vital to the functioning of tribes and all of its subdivisions and sub subordinate bodies. The waiver of a tribe's immunity from suit or action is occasionally required when entering into certain transactions. The court approved trust agreement that NAF contains, that created NAF contains a provision that requires tribal governments to provide this limited waiver of sovereign immunity in order to receive our NAF grant funding. The reason for this requirement stems from NAF serving as a fiduciary of the trust funds with a duty to protect its funds from fraud or gross mismanagement. For grant purposes, acceptable waivers of tribal sovereign immunity are limited to the amount of the NAF grants and to the duration of the grant relationship. So that is also a question that will sometimes arise um, 
this this form, this document um, is only applicable to your duration of your grant. If a tribe or tribal entity wants to accept NAF's grant funding and must work with the tribe's legal counsel to adopt a waiver of sovereign immunity related to NAF and a resolution for the tribal governing body. Tribal governments and instrumentalities must provide waivers and resolutions within three months of receiving their NAF grant award. Failure to submit an executed waiver and accompanying resolution in a timely manner will resort in forfeiture of any award amount. Both documents can be pre-approved by NAF to expedite the effort. Getting your documents pre-approved will save time during the application and post-award period. So I really encourage if you are um, applying via a tribe that you read this, you bring this to your leadership, um, have them be aware that this will be necessary um, upon uh, if you do receive funding from us, and we are happy to answer any questions that might um, come about. If your leadership has questions or concerns, you can direct them to our grants at inbox, and we will get those questions um, sent to the uh, proper individual. Our lawyer, Travis Trueblood, will be on our last webinar of this webinar series. Um, that webinar will be held to answer questions um, that y'all might have very specific to the grant application process. Um, and he, if you would like to invite your counsel to that webinar, they will be able to ask direct questions about the sovereign immunity waiver um, and get insight and direction on what it is that is needed, why it is needed. Um, and so I encourage you to invite um, any counsel that you have um, to that um, last webinar of our webinar series. All right, youth programming. So all eligible entity types. So 501c3s, tribes or instrumentalities, educational institutions, and CDFIs are able to apply for our youth programming. We do have some grantees that um, apply for our general funding and also apply for our youth programming. Um, Occupton, a CDFI, is one of those organizations that received both the general funding, and then also um, put in an application for youth programming. The youth application is com combined with a general application this year. So if you are a returning um, grantee or, or an individual who has gone through our application process, we are noting this year the youth is actually combined into that main application process within Foundant. So it makes it um, it makes it easier. You will not have to copy information over. Um, it will streamline the process. The available pool we have this year for youth programming is $1 million. The minimum amount that we request you put into your program funding is $20,000. Maximum amount that you can apply for is $200,000. Um, our open date um, for our RFA this year, it opened on March 1st. Our close date is May 1st. In the past, youth programming um, projects may have um, opened and closed on separate dates, um, but they will be opening, or they will be closing on the same date as our general application process. So May 1st, 2024 is the deadline. So I'm going to talk a little bit about evaluation criteria. So I noted at the beginning that we would go more in depth on impact on access to capital. Um, so impact on access to capital holds 25% weight of your score when we review the applications. So we want to know, are you providing access to capital or how is this project increasing access to capital and what does that look like? We also focus 25% on proposed results and outcomes. We want to know, who is this impacting? Is this a greater impact? Is this a regional impact? Um, are you, is this going to increase the amount of producers? Will this project um, build a data map? Will this, a data bank, will this project um, increase um, youth, um, youth access to um, farming and ranching efforts? So please, when you are applying for our funding, give us a bird's eye view of what this will what this funding will be used for and how it's going to to positively impact agriculture um, in indian country 
So we have farmer and demand, farmer and rancher demand, 20% weight. Um, please look at data and, and show us how um, this is needed and why this is needed. What is the demand in your area? What is the demand in your region? Um, as I shared some of the projects earlier, we talked about um, Washington State. Some of uh, the programs were harvesting seafood. So what's the demand of seafood um, in your region, if that's specific to you all? We have um, some projects were harvesting pine nuts, and that was very detrimental um, food sovereignty programming to their communities. Um, what does the demand look like, and how can this funding um, how can this funding really amplify the need and help the need, amplify the outcome and help the need um, for, for these far farmers and ranchers? We also look at team and organizational capacity and collaborators. That's a 10% weight. So who do y'all plan to um, help bridge gaps with? Who are you pulling in um, to collaborate with? Who did you talk to about um, potential, if you do receive this funding, about potentially um, collaborating with and, and serving your community with? And we also want to talk about evaluation. So that holds 10% weight. So thinking about in your application to us, sharing how how are you planning on um, showing the growth or showing the expansion, showing the positives that this this program and this project, um, how it's impacted your community? How are you evaluating that? What does that look like? You will be um, requested to provide summary reports to our compliance team and my team member Lenora Moore will go over that um, in further slides. But um, we want to know in, in your reports, you're going to be providing that information. I, you know, this project impacted X amount of farmers or X amount of youth or X amount of producers. And we're tracking that by utilizing this tool, by implementing this tool. So that's what we want to know there in evaluation. Innovation and replicability is 10% weight. Share with us how this is going to reach other um, communities and, and organizations that are interested in, in production, interested in farming and ranching, interested in food sovereignty. Is this something that other organizations can take and mirror? Can they, they make a sister program for that? We want to know um, exactly how it could be used by other individuals because at the end of the day, that's something that um, really maximizes the the um, the ask here of and how we're able to um, really provide opportunities to farming and ranching communities. Application review. So um, when we go through your application, we the components are outcome results based projects, access, access to capital, budget and budget narrative, a grantee meeting, intermediary funds, resume of key personnel, cover letters and support letters. So these are all things that um, will be um, incorporated into your into the application. So um, we need to know the outcome. We need to know um, how you're tying this back to access to capital. What does your budgeting look like along with your narrative? Um, and we do provide, so when you go through our application process, these documents will be provided there in there for you. So being able to add in your budget and your budget narrative, um, resume of your key personnel, who's on your team, who do you plan to have um, delivering these tasks and getting this work done. Uh, we encourage cover letters um, and we uh, support letters are optional, um, but um, cover letters does give us a, a really um, great uh, description of who you are and what it is that you're wanting to accomplish. Okay, so this is a really important note. There are now only 12 and 24 month projects. We have decided to eliminate 18 month projects. Um, grantees will now have the choice to pursue projects lasting either 12 or 24 months. Note that all grants retain the flexibility to complete their projects ahead of schedule. So in the past, we had our 18 month projects um, that you could um, gear your programming around, but this year we are um, only allowing 12 and 24 month projects. Um, just to note there too, the funding, if you were to receive the 200, if you were to apply for 
general funding and you wanted to apply for the maximum amount of the 200,000 and you your project is only 12 months or your project is 24 months, um, that doesn't impact how much you can apply for. So we encourage you if you're you're thinking you're having a 12 month project um, to have your budget narrative and your budget outline um, depict if that's the two if you want to go for 12 years. Oh, geez, Louise, 12 months. If you want to apply for our 12 month project, um, the 200,000 is still applicable to that 12 month project. I think that's a question we've had in the past was um, the length of your project. Does that impact the amount of funding you can apply for? All right, now I'm going to pass it over to my teammate, Lenora, where she will go over some budget notes and also go over the background of Foundant. Thanks, Chanel. Hi, everyone. My name is Lenora Moore. I'm a compliance officer here at NAF, and I'm a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. And so we wanted to give you a brief overview of um, what your application budget should look like and all of the points we need to cover for that. So for returning applicants and grantees, you may already know this, but NAF has a specific budget template that must be used when applying for funds and also when um, providing update and um, progress reports of your grant. And included in that budget template is an indirect limit. So while NAF allows indirect funds to be included in your grants, the limit is 15% of your personal and direct totals. So for example, if your personnel um, funds added up to 50,000 and your direct funds added up to 50,000, then you could use 15% of that total of 100,000 to spend towards indirect, but not more. Um, this is especially good to note if your project will have intermediary funds, which covers scholarships, regrants, or loans. Any funds in the intermediary category do not count towards your indirect limit. So please, um, whenever you're filling out your application budget, please remember to refer to our budget guidelines and just make sure that everything adds up correctly. Um, as I mentioned, um, we ask all the applicants to follow the budget guidelines and use our templates. If your application does not include a NAF budget template that may impact um, your success. And applicants, oh, you kind of, yeah. Applicants must abide by request minimums and maximums as listed in each category. And I just want to highlight some critical deadlines here. So I know we've told you once and we'll tell you again that our general and youth 2024 RFA closes May 1st at 1159 p.m. Central Time. And there is no opportunity to submit or edit an application after the deadline. So make sure you mark that on your calendars. So uh, for our returning applicants, you should already have your login credentials for Foundant, which is our grant management system that we use. So if you have those credentials on hand, you can log on to your profile and go straight to apply for the new 2024 RFA. For any new applicants, You'll follow the directions here to create a new account and follow the prompts to set up your profile. So once your profile has been set up, 
or once you've logged into your existing profile, this will be your home screen, your dashboard that you'll see. And as you can see, it'll have your applicant information, your organization information, and any active or historical requests request that you may have. And so next we'll show you exactly where to go to apply. And as you can see up there at the very top, it has a apply button. And that will take you to a list of any active um, applications. And as you can see on this example, our 2024 request will opened on March 1st and it will close on May 1st. And it is the only open application we have. So all you have to do is click the apply button. And that will take you to this screen here, which is at the beginning of the application. And you'll go through the application, filling it out. And I do want to remind everyone that it is okay to work on this application in pieces. Um, but just remember, every time you finish filling out a section to save your application so you don't lose any of your progress. And when you are finished, please make sure you submit your application. All right, thank you for your time and I'll hand it back over to Chanel. Hello everyone, thank you for submitting your questions. Um, so now we're gonna open this up for the questions and discussion period. Uh, so if you would like to submit your questions through the Q&A box or through the chat box, we'll be here to answer them. Um, but in the meantime, I think what we're gonna try to do is go ahead and read um, some of the questions that have already been asked. So one of the first questions that comes up is, can multiple entities uh, apply from one community? And yes, multiple entities are able to apply from one community. So for example, if um, your tribe um, wants to apply for one project serving native farmers and ranchers, but there's a separate goal in mind for another project uh, for one of your tribal instrumentalities, uh, they are able to apply for both. Uh, another question uh, that came through is if you're an individual tribal member who owns a private uh, farm uh, and they're the only employee, would they be able to apply for the grant? Uh, so unfortunately, individuals are not eligible to receive grants or loans directly from NAF, but they can seek grants and loans uh, from our NAF grantees. So we, if you have a question about which NAF grantees uh, that we have funded in the past, we would happy to we would be happy to make a connection for you. Um, entities receiving funds will be required to use those funds to provide services important to native farmers and ranchers or uh, those seeking to become farmers and ranchers. So uh, if the farm is registered as a 501c3 organization or an instrumentality of a tribe, it would be an eligible entity to apply for NAF funding. But if it is not one of the four eligible entities mentioned, unfortunately that farm would not be eligible to receive funding. All right. So any other questions that have come through? In the meantime, while maybe you're thinking about uh, questions, we can just do a quick overview um, of our website. Uh, if you've had a chance to go through and view what uh, information is available on there, 
Um, in addition, I just wanted to remind folks that you will be able to access this webinar recording as well as the PowerPoint slide deck. Uh, we will send it out via email to all registrants following this webinar. It will also be archived on the website, which I am about to show you now. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, we do have a resource where uh, you can um, you can uh, access our frequently asked questions. You could also reach out to us at our inbox at grants at Native American Agriculture Fund.org. So here is um, on my screen. Can you all see uh, our webpage here? This is the 2024 Request for Applications page. Um, as you scroll through, you can read uh, our overview document. Uh, you could actually also view the general application and youth application question list. You will also find the link to apply to our Fondant grant system. All of our contact information is on the screen. We have uh, more information to reiterate uh, who are eligible grant recipients, the different funding areas available. You can download a number of documents before you begin your application process. So as I mentioned, the overview document, which is a great place to start. You can also download the budget template, budget guidelines, the sample budget, sample budget narrative, all the way down to even thinking about how to reduce a PDF file. If you have any of those technical questions, again, you can feel free to reach out to our team. Uh, it also includes a checklist of things you may need ahead of time eligibility information, if you're applying through a fiscal sponsor, what information you'll need from them, uh, cover letters, support letters. Again, I think Chanel mentioned that in the presentation. Um, we also have a reminder for our upcoming webinars. Um, this one is one here, but on the last webinar, I will let you all know on April 25th that that will be a, a full-time question and answer period. So if you have uh, taking time today to just start getting to know more about our uh, organization uh, and our funding opportunities, then um, you start getting into the application and you have more questions that arise, you can come back and join us for that question and answer period. We will also have our attorney on, on, the, on the line as well. So if you have any questions about the sovereign immunity waiver, et cetera, uh, feel free to ask those then. We also provide video tutorials on the request for applications. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, there were frequently asked questions you can scroll through. You'll see as I scroll through here that there's a number of them available to you, uh, upwards of uh, more than 60 questions. And at the very bottom, actually, I apologize, there are way more than that. There are more close to 90 questions. Um, we try to include the questions that are asked in our webinar on the website as well. Uh, and then you'll find the webinar recordings as well as the option to download the slides. Um, so we had another great question come through. Uh, I apologize. I don't know about a UEI number. Is Chanel, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. I believe as long as you have 501c3 status, um, then you're okay. I, I think the UEI number is in regard to a SAM account, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I think that comes from like the GSA and the SAM.gov website. And that's like small business, um, I think. So as long as um, you have 501c3 status, you should be good to go. But we can we can um, for sure get an answer on that, Whitney, and circle back to you, Bonnie. Great, thank you. All right, are there any other questions that come through? Okay, so I um, well, I think our team is going to stick around here for just a, a few more minutes. Um, feel free to hop off if you don't have any more questions. Uh, I do want to um, mention that we do have another request for application opportunity open through another organization. So that organization is called the Sovereign Equity Fund. And they have a request for application period open from uh, now until July 1st. 
And that uh, request for application period is about their cultural food waste fund. And that cultural food waste um, fund is, uh, provides up to $200,000 to tribal colleges and universities to conduct projects that focus on uh, learning about, sharing, and safeguarding the artistic, cultural, and humanist, uh, humanistic aspects of Native food ways. So this opportunity is designed to highlight place-based and people-centered connections that focus on the importance of food and agriculture to tribal communities and beyond. Um, they have their own request for applications webinar opportunity. So if you have more questions on that and you're working for a tribal college or university and you'd like to um, talk about funding opportunities and work that addresses the traditions or ceremonies, uh, more of the humanity side of traditional foodways, uh, we will drop a link to those webinars um, here in the chat box and a, a link to their uh, web page itself. So I'm going to do that now. And any questions regarding that can be emailed to grants at sovereignequityfund.org. Thank you so much, Riley. And we'll make sure to put that email address in the chat there too. Um, so we did have a question uh, about whether or not we are prioritizing certain geographies. No, no priorities will go or we won't prioritize any certain geographies. We just encourage all areas to apply. What I do encourage you to do is look at our website and find uh, where we have funded in the past. So you can look at example grant projects. Uh, you can also look at some of our census data. Um, it will be updated with 2022 soon, but you can see where a number of the native producers are. So uh, another resource I encourage you to look at is called the Native Land Information System. So if you're looking at incorporating data potentially um, for your reservation to um, address the, uh, producers and their access to capital, um, it's a really great resource for you. So I'm gonna drop their chat in, or their link in the chat as well. Great. Okay. Um, if, just as a reminder, um, our upcoming webinar, we have another question and answer period available on April 11th from 2 to 4 p.m. Central and then April 25th from 2 to 4 p.m. Central as well. And again, as a reminder, that one will be full time uh, open, open question and answer period. The one on April 11th will uh, we'll go over the same information on this PowerPoint uh, in the first 45 minutes and then we'll open up for question and answer periods. Okay, so our team will stick around for three more minutes. Um, and but we're this is not the last chance for you all to get in touch with us if you have any, any questions that come up. Um, but thank you all again for your time and joining us, and we appreciate you being here. <laughs>